So uh, then we have to look at some of the essentials for assembling plant genomes. And here again, you know, I bring up the sequencing platforms again because they're very much related to uh, what you can do with the data in terms of assembly. Then we look at a genome assembly workflow. So what has to come first, second, and then we look in the conjunction with genome assembly work for paired and reads and made pair libraries. You don't have to worry about it now, I'll explain it to you. Then we look at high C chromosome confirmation capture, also in conjunction with assembling a genome. And then we look finally of mapping, optical mapping of long sequence reads. Well, and finally, I'll give you a few examples of, by now, completely sequenced genomes. But let's start with the simple things. You remember the sequencer spits out raw data. They come in fast queue. And then you do the demultiplexing. Anybody remember what is the demultiplexing? Different primers to get different uh, sizes. Say again, please. And you use different primers so you can amplify a lot of different parts from the uh, I'm afraid that is a little off the target. Okay. <laughs> no, when you use different uh, groups or barcodes from different samples. The barcode is the keyword. You have to put specific DNA sequences into the sequence to be sequenced for the reason that you can pool them in one well, but you know you don't need this in the end. You have everything separated and then you get in silico. This is all done in the computer. You just tell them just remove the stupid barcode and we don't need it anymore, but now you have it sort. Now, then you start uh, looking at map reads and there's all sorts of different softwares. I just mentioned a few of them to align things. Important is, for SNP calling to uh, identify SNPs, and we did this on third and Wednesday afternoon quite a bit. We use a software called Tassel. I'll talk about this briefly. And finally, if everything really works for you, you have a linear, general linear model of your genome, which would mean you have whatever, for instance, if there are 10 chromosomes, you should have, in the end, hopefully, 10 linkage groups in a sort of meaningful linear arrangement. Okay, here again, you have to remember a number of different formats. And these are general formats which always uh, are now used in, 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 the system, in, in this type of research. So the raw sequence, and they all designated as raw, is what actually comes out of the sequence. So you can't really use it any way, but then you go to FASTQ. These are, it's a text-based format. And uh, I just mentioned here the, uh, the, the web page where you can actually look it up. And it's a standard format, and you know, you work with it with NCBI. I mean, FASTQ, everything has to be, yeah. Is FASTQ the same as FAST? Yes. Okay. There are some slight variations on it, but this is essentially, uh, usually it could, or could be also fast A, fast Q, but anyways, it's a standard format. There might be additional information to it, but it's a standard format, and if you don't use it, none of the program's gonna work. And remember, uh, Alejandro gave you some examples where you actually take text formats and clean it up so it gets into a fast Q format. Usually when I, I use this, uh, I just type it in courier, new, and then it works. Any other print, as far as I know, has all sorts of additional formatting information hidden behind the letter, and then the, the programs don't recognize it. Then we talked briefly about SAM, sequence aligned and map. This is a human readable information which contains, again, sequence, but also quality information and preferably, if possible, also some map information. And then 
this is large and then you condense it into a binary alignment map. It's short, it's storable, but you can read it, so you have to use SAM tools to be able to read it. So you have this to look at, this to store. If you want to look at this, you use SAM tools to get this again. And finally, there is the VCF format. This is sort of on the way to get SNPs, and this is the variant call format. So if you have segregation in an F2, you have variants which are segregating, or you have a population of variants, so you have the VCF format. And this contains actually metadata, meaning that there's information possibly if available on the position in the genome, where it's on the map, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this stores gene sequence variations with as much possible information as possible. Okay, let's look at the workflow again. Here are the raw reads, and you know this QA means every time you look at this, you have to put in some quality control. Then you clean up the reads, and this means demultiplexing, removing, what else do we have to do when we do the cleanup? We talked about the multiplex and what else do we have to remove? The adapters. Adapters. We don't need adapters. We know them. So we have to throw away adapters and keep remembering this is not wet chemistry that's all done in a computer. And then you just, if you're lucky, you have a reference genome. You can use a reference genome to actually annotate. Oftentimes, if you don't have a reference genome, you don't have anything to look at and you cannot annotate. But anyways, you get raw, bam, this uh, transported, and raw, bam, whenever you want to look at it, you make SAM out of it. And then once you look at the raw, bam of a genome, you go ahead and remove in sort of one step after the other duplicates. There might be, all of a sudden you find there's a certain number of sequences that occur twice or three times to be thrown out. And finally, you have the process, bam. And once you have that, you can either do SNP calling and variant call format, <coughs> or if you had this made from a transcription library, so you can actually, uh, if you have, let's say you have two, Plants, one you infect with a fungus, the other one of the same genotype you just leave as a control. Then you collect all the RNA and ask the question, are there certain RNAs being expressed in the plant which is, has been infected by the fungus? That is when you look at differential expression. And if you're lucky, you'll find a few genes which are expressed. If you're not lucky, you find 100 genes which are expressed and you know, well, you know, that's research. <laughs> okay, if you don't want to do this, I mean, you, don't, you shouldn't be in research. <laughs> okay, so this is the workflow. And uh, when you have high throughput sequencing, you remember this is shotgun. We talked about the little movie you have to assemble. Just to uh, tell you, individual strands are approximately 400 base pairs long out of a 10 to the 9th base pair long ge genome. The unordered, unoriented reads. And in the silico now, you have to produce consensus sequences or contiguous sequences like context. Well, this sort of a schematic representation, you have reads going this way, reads going this way, and you want to set from all those reads context. And that would be your smallest actually assembled unit. When you have your contents in the process of being assembled, you have to order them. And then we briefly talked about paired and reads. We'll, we'll get to, to the details there. Paired and reads, typically <coughs> you, look at, you look at the sequences of the ends of each read, and you pick about 100 mer. That is a reasonably safe amount of data 
to make uh, fine homologies at a very high confidence. That is one, and then you have map paired and breeds. I briefly alluded to this when you want to have longer pieces. You can kind of flip them together when we look at this in detail. And then once you have all this, you can set up a draft sequence. <coughs> it's not nice to draft sequence, but it works. And the idea is to order all your different contains in, in order so you get all sorts of homologies and eventually you just start building an entire genome. In this case, it would start here <coughs> and come to here. And this is what you are when you start. And we should look at a few essentials. Pro professor, yeah. in the last example, what are the scaffolds? Scaffolds. We will get to the scaffolds. Okay. I just want to make sure uh, we, we get the principle. Scaffolds is one order higher, the okay. bigger pieces, okay. but in the end, you just sort of tile them. They call it also tiling. Put one over the other. Mm. I have two questions. I think they're very basic, but um, regarding the adapters, yes. Mm, how do you choose? How do you make them? Like, how do you choose what the adapter should look like? like oh, sequence? you don't have a choice. Uh, depending on the company or well, machine okay. you use, they tell you what to do. Because remember, in the Illumina, you attach the adapters to your slide. Okay. Uh, the company tells you it has to be this thing on, and if not, <coughs> No, no choice. The other one is, I think I don't understand completely the what a pair and uh, Well, we'll get to this in a few minutes. Okay. So I will explain the, the paired end as well as the, uh, <coughs> the uh, paired end reads and the, uh, uh, the made, made end reads. I will explain the details to you. So i just give you an idea what it, what's in there. But before we do this, we should look at some of the uh, considerations when you do a sequence. And when you have the sequence of a genome, you also have to look at the size, what you get. And you have to look at the complexity of the genome, and particularly you have to look at the complexity of your sequence data. And this is done by the Kamer frequency distribution. We'll get to this in a minute. Then you look at DNA quality and availability. You know, if you have uh, want to sequence uh, pollen grains, you don't have a, a lot of DNA, and you still need DNA to sequence. So this is all considerations. And then again, which comes into play is the type of sequencing platform. Some of it you need little DNA, little qual small amount of DNA because you amplify a lot. If you look at PacBio or Nanopore, it's direct real-time sequencing. You probably need a bit more, but of a different quality. So these are all things you just have to keep in mind. And then when you assemble, and now comes your scaffolds, you have different scaffolding approaches from the context to get to the next higher level of assembly. Uh, you could make mate paired libraries, use high C chromosome confirmation capture. Then you have bio nano optical mapping. And there is 10x genomics, which I uh, don't think has been used a lot. It's kind of a Chinese company. And then once you're through all this, you have to validate the assembly. And once you have the assembly validated, so no duplicates in there, and no strange things, then hopefully if you have a uh, reference library, you can do a genome annotation. But here again, you go to NCBI, you find homologies that tell you, in fact, you use uh, maize, for instance, or coffee, that tell you it's some weird enzyme of that same sequence, maybe a 70, 80% homology from weird bacteria. 
So I would be very suspicious what it really means. Somebody just placed this name to the thing and that could be anything. Just be cautious. Okay, now size of co and complexity of a genome also very interesting to consider. For build, building an entire genome, and I just put for easy a small genome, less than <coughs> 500 gigabase pairs, so for instance, rice or Arabidopsis, but in higher plants, I mean, there's a few of them left. I mean, there's not much of a chance. Uh, if it's a haploid genome, it's perfect. You have to do either ovules, but that's difficult to extract because you have other tissues there. But you could use pollen grains, or if you happen to work with certain ferns and they take certain stages, but let's assume we'll work with higher plants, then uh, they're the only source of uh, haploid tissue, tissue or gametes, in this case, pollen. And the other thing which is good is diploid, preferably if it's homozygous and if it's inbred. We work with hop, it's diploid, it's dioecious, so male and female plants, it's heterozygous, has a huge genome. Okay. <laughs> the challenging part, we get right to that here, large genomes bigger than 1 gig to 10 gig, not in bread, hop for instance, or coffee, although coffee is not too bad. Sugarcane is a real bummer. Heterozygous, heavily rearranged genomes, and different haplotypes. And we'll talk about haplotypes later. Now, let's come to the Kamer part. This is a, uh, an important function when you use computers. Remember, <coughs> you tile, you try to tile overlapping sequences into a contiguous sequence. Now, if you were to do this with huge pieces like 400, I guess mathematically, and I'm not a specialist on this, it's very difficult to do. So you have to break down your sequence in smaller portions and tile them and place it together. And these small portions they call subsequences of a length k, they're called k merge. So they are subsequence, like you have a 400 base pair sequence, you break it down in small packages called k merge, but they're not at random. So I show you here a sequence, and we look at a very short k merge of six. Now you can look down here. The first kmer, six bases, A, G, T, T, G, A. Second kmer goes like this, like this, like this. So you see, it's an overlapping sequence broken down in smaller proportions. And this apparently is doable with computers of those we use. I guess uh, some uh, secret services have different equipment, but we don't have that available. But so you have to break down the whole package in kmer. And more importantly, it gives you also some idea on the quality of your sequence right off the fast queue coming out of the machine. And I'll give you two examples here. That's a bit bigger camer. It's 31 bases long. That would be the camer. And they set up, that's a theoretical frequency plot of camers. On the left hand side, you see the number of sequence reads which contains this kamer and of course other pieces of the sequence. But you look just, if this is kamer is inside of the sequence, you look at the numbers of it, <coughs> and you look how oftentimes this particular sequence occurs. And you can see one thing, there is the kamer coverage depth here, in this case, sequencing coverage is 20x, you get a peak. Then it slopes off, the sequencing depth gets lower, but you get one very high peak up in the front. There are very many unique camers, not too many in that sequence. This means they're sequencing errors. So this is sort of a quality control of your sequence. If you had a diploid one, same graph, you have one peak and you have a for the heterozygous, the second peak. 
And then again, you have a large quantity of very few sequencing depth of cameras by very high number. This means the errors. This has to be considered, and this tells you right away before you do any further step if it's worth to work with that particular sequence coming out of the machine. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, the number of cameras is a parameter to know some quality control step. No. Say again. The number of cameras <coughs> is, a, is that something about quality control step or something like that? It is a quality control step, and you know you pick a certain stretch of sequences because you have to break down your DNA and then you find out how often times this is repeated, how does it overlap. And if it's often times, 20, 30 times in a given sequence, it's a good quality sequence. If this camera occurs only once in the sequence and it happens to be another sequence that occurs only once, then you know the quality is bad. So it's essentially a quality control. So when you look at those graphs, yeah. mm, what are you looking for? For example, how do you say I know my camera is a good quality? Well, this is a 20, uh, sequencing coverage here is 20x. So it's quick sequencing depth is pretty good, it's 20x. And here you see the sequencing depth is, well, probably one. So there's one sequence with that just one camera in there, and then there's a lot of them, these are errors. Whereas here, you, you expect well, two peaks and a heterozygote. So with a reasonable high sequencing depth. Now this is a good example, that's actually data from E. coli. E. coli is haploid. So uh, you run this <coughs> same experiment, and you count the numbers of sequences, you see there is a very nice peak right here. So uh, high sequencing depth and a high number of, it's overall it's not a million, but it's a couple of hundred sequences. And then of course it drops off. So it, it was an eight mer, eight came, eight uh, mer camber. Now how does it play out when you come to assembly? This is your unknown genome. We want to find out the sequence of that genome. And then you have various reads. And they're randomly chosen and they have errors. And wherever there's a little X, there's an error. And then you use your camera technology to actually place all these cameras on top of each other. And if you have in one particular sequence a lot of camers, remember, they tile each other. A lot of them, you know, it's good quality. You just go through this, but you have certain sequences which has only one camer in it, or a different one, and then you know it occurs rare, and then you know it's an error. When it's a very low abundance, it's an error. So if you're able to tile many of these cameras in a given sequence on top of each other, you know it's good. And if you find lots of them, but only once or twice, it's no good. So this is a way of filtering out erroneous data. Because as I mentioned earlier, these sequencing machines make mistakes. What you want to get in the end is a nice contig you pile all these different sequence pieces on top of each other, and then you have a consensus contig. These are aligned reads. You have eliminated all the rare ones with uh, low representation. You get the ones which have a good sequence coverage, and then you tile them on top of each other, and you get a consensus sequence and contig, a contiguous sequence. Now, when you look at sequencing technologies again, you get short reads in Illumina, Roche 454, and Iron Turned. There it becomes very important 
to have in the shotgun sequencing part, look at this Kamer business, because uh, there's a lot of short pieces you somehow have to align, and you only want to do the alignment with those which have been sequenced many times, and they're all alike. And you remember, the Kamers really help programs to make decent alignments. When you have long reads like in Pac Bio, Oxford, Nanopore, it is not that important simply because you have very long reads. Yet, you have to be aware of the fact that those two technologies, well, what is the problem when you compare this with this and when you think about the Kamers? There is a certain pitfall in the problem here. It's harder to align very long sequences. Oh, I'd be happy if I have long sequences. But there is a problem with these long sequences. When you think about cameras, what, what we use the cameras for? There was a quality control. So I think you have very long sequences, but you have less of them. Exactly. And so you don't, because of probability, or? No, I would, I would say it's even simpler because of mistakes the polymerase makes. Okay. You get mistakes in these long sequences. So, the, what are you throwing in? What well, room? Or sit over there. I mean, you might not. You might not want to see my back. It's not my no, we to sit over here. Look. You, you don't see anything. You see a whiteboard. That's not interesting either. So the, the point really is on this very long sequence you get mistakes. Uh, so usually what you like to do is get a very long sequence, be aware of the mistakes, get your nice uh, short reads from other technologies, and then fix the big one. Okay, let's look at the assembly now. Now this is uh, just a picture from uh, of a graduate student who's, who actually did the whole sequence of barley. Uh, so Niels uh, sent me this picture with barley chromosomes and what he did there, he used fish fluorescent in situ hybridization. We actually use hybridization on the level of a chromosome with a specific probe and you see here nice centromeric probes. Just to give you an idea, this is what you want in the end in the sequence. So when you, on the way to that assembly, we talked about context, using overlaps, and in between is this quality control with Kamers. And once you have your contigs, they're not very big either. Next thing, you have to come to the scaffolding. So you try to assemble contigs in a larger unit. And so here you see different scaffolds, being formed from different contexts. But again, this tries to tell you there is a contact in blue, and this next contact to it fits here. And there's another contact here, blue, and this is adjacent to a contact in another piece of DNA. And obviously, between the two is a gap. So when you assemble the contacts, to scaffolds, well, first of all, you have contacts, you eliminate as much as possible the gaps in the contacts, but when you want to assemble contacts to a larger structure, to a scaffold, you still have gaps. And then you have to probably resequence, use a different sequencing technology, rescan your library again. Hopefully, since you now know in the scaffold all the sequence here and all the sequence here, you have a larger idea of what your sequence will be. And then you take those and find sequences which fit to this <coughs> larger part in view of those two ends. Then you hopefully gap this. Sometimes it doesn't work, you have to resequence it. You fill the gaps. And once you have most gaps filled, you still end up with small gaps, but then you can, the scaffolds can actually then be assembled to a larger structure. You get a draft genome. 
but the draft genome doesn't mean you have, uh, for instance, in Hop, we have a draft genome. Hop has 10 chromosomes. We have something like 50,000 scaffolds. So that doesn't quite match the number of linkage groups. But here is still a lot of work to be done. It looks simple. Once these bioinformatic guys or girls sit on the computer, sometimes you hear them swearing a lot because it doesn't work so well. <laughs> Once you have these on field gaps, that means there are different chromosomes. If this is your gra draft genome, this would represent one chromosome. And then so this draft genome would be one chromosome with a few holes in it, and you have some shorter chromosomes with hopefully no holes in it. Nonetheless, it's nice, but remember the updates in the NCBI database. People keep sequencing, and they find out there were errors here, there were errors there, and then you just bring it into the, 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 the NCBI. Gradually, the quality of the data through the cooperation, indirect cooperation of people will be improved. Now, contents and scaffolds just to uh, make sure everybody understood it. And short and sequences, you have 200, optimistically 800, short pieces of DNA being sequenced. They're random because remember, you share the DNA by one way or another. And those, you have either single end or paired end sequencing. If you do single end sequencing, you have the sequence of one end, or you have paired end and you have sequences on both ends and oftentimes this is very good to use because you have information on both ends plus the sequence in the middle. But it's short. Let's say 400 on average. It's a short piece. You can overlap but always keep in mind there are repetitive sequences. There are introns. If you hit the first intron or you hit the first transposon, you're stuck because you don't know, it goes to piece two or does it go to piece 100. So try to get larger pieces to assemble, which you cannot sequence, but you can try to assemble them. You do a, what they call a mate paired end sequencing. So you get bigger pieces of DNA, two, usually two to three, they say you're 40, I'm not sure whether this is good, but you can do it. You use larger pieces of DNA, attach to the end uh, sequences which would then you can align those sequences and ligate. Once you have ligated those ends, then you go ahead and uh, actually remove those two ends which are ligated together. You can sequence the two ends. So essentially what you do you have a large piece of DNA you don't know, but you know what is exactly the sequence at the end of it. So that's a big advantage in factor 10 more or less compared to this here. We have a short piece, there you know the entire sequence here, but you don't know what is next. But if you have these short pieces and you have these large pieces, you know this is the end and this is the end, then you can place it in the middle. So that's paired end sequencing. Made paired actually because you made it. Now this is how it's done. You have the short insert, it's 200 to 800 base pair fragments. You place your adapters, your question, the adapters, the company tells you what to use. And you have, of course, your indexing sequence, your barcode. Then you just sequence it and you get this piece. A mate pair, when you make a mate, yep, those indexes are also given by the technology you're using? No, you can use whatever you want, but there are certain, I forgot the name, there's a certain bacteria which produces some unique DNA sequence, or you can generate it randomly. Uh, so you have a library, I could have brought this along, I have a library of about 100 of these uh, barcodes we input into a pod. They're just randomly made. First of all, you have to look at the 
look at the fact that they are not too common in the genome. Secondly, they have to be unique. So they're attached here, plus the red thing up should be the adapters you use, use just for the sequencing technology. Mate pairs, you circularize a large fragment of DNA, you shear it, then you uh, prepare the ends so you can ligate it, then this is covalently circularized, like it's the same as you would in introduce some like put a piece of DNA into a plasmid, they have to match and then you use uh, ligase and then it's in there. But then you digest the entire ligated circle in small pieces and then up here you attach strap avidine, biotin, and then you can actually pull down with magnetic beads again these stretches which are just around the two ends of the, so the mate end pair, so the two ends far away, brought together, then you cut everything away which is around it, throw it away, use this to sequence it. Getting more distance information, you don't know what's in the middle, but you have the information of the end. And finally when you construct a scaffold, it would be always nice if you have a reference genome. Unfortunately, many times if you do a new job, you don't have a reference genome. If you work with corn, wheat, any poeshi, you have rice as a reference genome. For dicotyledons, you always would try to look at uh, Arabidopsis. However, Arabidopsis is a uh, Brassica CA. If you look at many different plants, you don't find too many similarities. So it's not going to be very helpful. But still, it's good to have a reference genome. And then you have your mate paired breeds at the end. You don't know what's in the middle, but then you can organize this all together into, again, a longer unit, and you get a scaffold. And you go back to this with your mate paired or mid year with end mate paired end rates and try to fill in all the sequence information on the scaffolds. You still in the end there are locks uh, holes in it, but okay. Now that's one technology to uh, find bigger to, to identify sequences at the end of a large stretch of DNA. There's another technology, this is called HI-C, chromosome confirmation capture. Here again, the idea is not to get the sequence of a long stretch of DNA, but to get sequence information of DNA which is somehow physically associated. So what you do here, you capture physically proximal sequences. So you just take your entire genome in a cell and then you carefully denature proteins in the nucleus. This means histone proteins or other proteins which are associated with the DNA will be denatured and then they can't be removed anymore. Next thing you do is cut everything with an friction enzyme. So you end up with two fractions, DNA and DNA with denatured, a denatured protein. And that's what you want. Then you just take the, again, uh, fill in the ends, which are broken and attach biotin to it. And once the biotin is, is attached, you anneal the two ends on top of it, so you have the two loose ends, which are physically close, close by in the nucleus. In the end, you have them attached to each other in a piece of DNA. Then you cut again, shear it or cut it, whichever way. So you finally will look for those pieces here which have the biotin attached to it. You bind this to strep avidine, 
pull it down with magnets. So what you get in the end is the, which you can sequence in the end. And the idea is you have out of a sudden information of two pieces of DNA in the genome which were probably quite a ways away, but physically they were close simply because they were nearby in the, in the nucleus due to and proteins which are associated with the DNA. So again, more information about the 2D, 3D structure. So that's called Hi-C. I'll give you an example how this works. When they use these Hi-C technology, this is a chromosome 4 of barley. Here is the predicted position on the chromosome. When you use all these high C captured sequences and align them along the chromosome, each little blue line is the sequence. You get a fairly nice linear alignment along the stretch of the chromosome. So here again you have further information that helps you to align these. I always have to remind you, you have 300 to 500 base pair sequences, not more. And the trick is, put them in a bigger picture. Now this is another actual experiment from the barley sequencing from Niels. Uh, this shows you the alignment of these high sequences, high C sequences, when you place chromosome high C and chromosome sequences by genotyping by sequencing, plot them against each other. What you see here one chromosome, second chromosome, third, four, five, six, seven. A nice linear arrangement and the straight lines, this is the gaps between the chromosomes. So actually by using high C and genomic sequences, you can actually get very nice alignments. And now, going back to your single sequences, unique sequences, I can ask the question, is it here? There, so there. So you have immediately information. If the sequence is homologous to up here, you know it is probably chromosome five. Now you find a lot of times these heat maps. There are various ones around. I won't, won't go in detail, but it's the same story. You have chromosome segments versus sequence. Wherever it's very dark red, it's a high degree of homology, and when you have chromosome segments, and this is not individual chromosomes, but there are segments of the chromosome, the length of the chromosome, the sequence, and you see all those, obviously, physically quite close. So, we're still not happy with what we're doing. There's still bits and pieces. We want to assemble the genome. There's another technology, this is called optical mapping. Now what it does, I'm afraid it's a little small, but uh, they wouldn't take it apart at this company. But it's uh, one company, BioNano, the others around. But what they do, they isolate high molecular weight DNA. They take this high molecular weight DNA of the entire genome, but they use restriction enzymes and carefully cut this and insert instead of uh, inserting the gaps uh, a piece of DNA with a fluorescent probe on it. So you have your entire genome of large pieces of DNA cut in a little bit, not cut through but just nicked. In, instead of the, in, in, in the nick you reassemble it with a fluorescent probe then you have a lot of pieces of DNA from the entire genome, which at different positions, those positions where there was a restriction site for a specific enzyme, is now a fluorescent probe. So obviously, across the entire genome, there are different distances between restriction sites. So I told you, maize equal one every 7,000, that's on average. But in one place it's narrow, one place is wider, so you actually Mark with a fluorescent probe the entire genome, the DNA of the genome with these fluorescent probes. And then they send it through a, here's again, a mate between uh, 
semiconductor technology and biotechnology, send it through a machine which looks at the fluorescence of individual DNA strands. And when you do this, you can actually make pretty good alignment over the entire genome. You don't know the sequence, but you know how things are interrelated. And uh, this is sort of a picture of the machine and what it does essentially, it takes the DNA in solution and laces it to a microchannel. The microchannel is very small, obviously, and you pull in a single strand of DNA this is a schematic picture from the company of, uh, well, the, you can't see it, it's so small anyways. But essentially what it is, here comes the DNA in, and then how some more along the line, they untangle it and pull it into a thin channel, pull it through there. And while it's going into the channel, it reads the fluorescence. And since you have many channels, you read a lot of fluorescence at the same time. And in the end, you look at patterns of fluorescence. So let's look at this one here. There is a few things of fluorescence in this strand of DNA, in this strand of DNA. You see, there's a unique pattern of not fluorescent originally, these were DNA sequences for the restriction endonuclease. The recognition side of the restriction endonuclease is in a specific pattern made visible by the fluorescent dye and when you have this all in parallel coming out of the machine out of the sun you see okay this fits this fits this fits so obviously all my strands of DNA are aligned over the genome when you go back to your sequence now you have your sequence information of this strand here let's say you have sequence from this strand here and this little piece you already know, aha, it belongs to position 600 and something in the genome because you have a line in bio-optical mapping. And this is actually not from the company representation, but this is again from barley sequencing of the genome from Niels. This is how it looks like in the flu cell. These are real data. And uh, Niels gave you that too. You see the alignment is very nice for a specific marker. And what is important here, the size is 275 KB. You looked at it once. And the throughput is 150 KB, totaling 294 gigabase. So you do this a lot in parallel, so your quality improves. And uh, one scan gives you 1.6 gig. And what is more important than those numbers is the fact that it's N50. N50 means that more than 50% of the data are of good quality. So it's not, you, you will find this number a lot in bioinformatics. So if it's good quality, it has to be N50 or higher. Or they tell sequence information N50 and then give you a number. See, you see a very nice peak here. And just uh, look at the, it's hard to read because it's a shot of the computer. But here you see the peak at, what is it, 180 or something KB of this particular read. So to recapitulate, you have the mate paired reads aligning two ends, sequencing the ends. Then you have the uh, uh, high C information and since things in the chromosome are much more complicated the distances between the two pieces physically sort of aligned by denaturing uh, some histone protein could be much further apart to get information here information there and then to get the whole picture you actually go through the genome large pieces of DNA look for specific restriction in the nuclease recognition sites. Nick attached to this side a fluorescent probe and then pulled single molecules through these microchannels and with aligning all these different uh, fluorescently labeled channels you get the overall picture where you see here it's a nice pattern. Okay, 
there's of course uh, always in the background looms their repetitive sequences. But you know, try to stress this, go back to this picture, or better yet to the schematics. When you have repetitive sequences, they're incorporated into these long stretches. If you try to align mate paired ands, even high C, and there comes a repetitive sequence, you're stuck. Whereas here you have a long strand of DNA, there might be repetitive sequences somewhere in here, but still you get information left and right. You said, okay, there is, I don't know, microsatellites, uh, 100 copies, but I know this is uniform information left and right. And remember, many genomes have more than 70% repetitive information. Okay, now let's look at some samples of sequence genomes, just to sum, sum it up. Rice, we looked at it before. It's small, it's a reference for all monocots, more or less, Moetius at least. This is the maize genome, and there are different uh, inbred lines. And you know, you might wonder what these funny arches are. Mm -hmm. These are chromosome duplications. So parts of the chromosomes have been duplicated. So one piece which is sequenced here also will be on this chromosome. So over evolution, you not only have an expanding of a genome by transposons and repetitive elements, but also you have uh, genome duplication, which can be actually quite important. I always mention dogs. You know, dogs uh, come in this size to horse size. So it's an enormous dynamic when it comes to uh, the genome. I mean, you try to add an additional genome to our, an additional chromosome to our genome, you, we have tremendous problems. Most likely we will not even be born. But dogs have all these variations, mutations. And this is actually the fact, I think a dog has 86 or 82 chromosomes. So obviously, there's a lot of genome duplication in the genome, so you can tolerate various mutants when you get a little rat to a horse-like <laughs> dog. So maize, remember I mentioned uh, uh, sorghum and maize. The chromosome has duplicated or triplicated at one particular point. So these are what these lines are. And then, of course, the details are not that important because there are various uh, uh, elements they all put in this graph. And they have rice chromosomes. I think the blue one is the rice genome. And they're, oh, I can't remember where they are. Anyways, they compare rice genome with sorghum genome. But it just tells you that you get usually those maps. That's another one. This is barley now. That's recently been published here in 2012 by Niels in the uh, Institute of uh, Plant Research in Gottes name. And here you see the chromosomes, and there is additional information in this map. And here again, sequence is referred to the reference genome. This is rice inside here. And that is Coffea conifera, uh, because uh, and it's not even complete. They have pseudochromosomes. It's not real chromosomes, but they just assign things which are aligned to a chromosome. And what is interesting, here is your genetic map. These are the oriented scaffolds. They are non-oriented scaffolds. This means they assume they are there, but they don't know which order they are. And when you look at the Actually, like this is pseudochromosome one. When you look at the length of the chromosome, you, there here is an interesting graph that shows your exons. That's what you're really interested in because of these are the expressed genes. Like you see, the green one is a retrotransposon named Gypsy. Uh, the red one is a retrotransposon named Scopia. And uh, they have DNA transposons. There's a few of them here. The light elements right there. So that tells you there's a happy distribution of these uh, repetitive elements. 
along the length of the chromosome. And as I mentioned before, I mean, the conifera is quite big. Arabica is even bigger, twice as big. I found this was is, is from a paper where they actually looked at genes which are involved in interesting secondary metabolites like caffeine and other substances in different species. And they compared this uh, in uh, sort of a tree where they looked at relationships. And what I found interesting, coffee, tomato, these are utricularia, that's a uh, plant living in the water. So they're somehow, as far as the secondary metabolites, sequen sequentially related. And there are see ergodops and papaya and cacao that are somehow related to their secondary metabolites with reference to the sequence. And then there is soybean, straw, peach, poplar, but they're not that interesting. I think this is here. And then the other thing which they looked at, which I found quite interesting, is the level of gene order conservation. So how are certain genes organized in the genome in relation to each other? So if genes, I think I mentioned the, uh, uh, the resistant genes, they're often in clusters. Now genes are very important in the genome, oftentimes they're clustered. You don't want to have them segregate or even disappear from one linkage group, go to another. And here you see a lot of sequence conservation in these genes in strawberry and papaya, and coffee is not that high. So that means the genes related to production of specific secondary metabolites are clustered. And they're through all sorts of evolution state clustered. So obviously the genes are in a way important to be together, expressed together, else they would have been all over the place. Now just to finalize this, look at a comparative mapping of serial genomes. They looked at the triticae, maize, sorghum, sugarcane, the grass, and rice. And when you put this all together, in a, there's the biggest one is triticae and rice. Let me see, where is it? It's the red one in the middle. This is the rice genome. It's the smallest. But the interesting thing is they're all interrelated. So you go across the entire maps. You always find that certain chromosomes are certain genes of certain sequences. So obviously, evolutionary, they're related. And that's a good thing when you have a reference genome. Once you have the reference genome, you find another sequence, another, ge another species, and try to find local sort of places with respect to the reference genome. Okay, let's summarize this part. We looked at sequence data format and briefly at the workflow for assembly. Uh, we talked a bit about what are essential things, like what platform you use, what are problems, big heterozygous translocations, as opposed to haploid, which is easy, or small genome. Then we looked at KMERS, which are an essential tool in assembling sequences and also as a quality control tool. Then we looked at sequencing platform. We talked then about pair then and main pairs to get larger and more distant information in sequences. High C, confirmation capture. And finally, optical mapping to get even information with real big picture. And then, of course, we looked at a few examples. Questions? With the high C technology, do you, does it give you information about the genetic distance? Because it's, I understood it was a physically, yeah. how close the genes are? Yes, but that's, but that's what it tells you. It translates in the distance in the yes. linkage groups. Okay. But, I mean, you could probably use it, and I don't know whether people have done that. You could probably use it to ask uh, recombination frequencies and physical distance. How is this interrelated? 
we published a paper a couple of years back when we didn't have this technology, but this was in maize. So we looked at the fluorescent and situ hybridization on chromosomes. So where did specific sequences localize on chromosomes? And colleagues of ours in Colorado, they looked at with the electron microscope and recombinations where they recognized crossovers. There was a very nice interrelationship between where you see fish markers and crossovers. But that paper is uh, over 10 years old, so I know technology has changed. More questions? Yeah? If you want to be sure about the quality of your data, uh, other aspects different from gamers, uh, what, what do you think is important to, to keep in mind? Well, the gamers gives you information uh -huh. on the quality of the sequence, uh -huh. not of the individual sequences, just tells you the quality of the sequence. Uh -huh. Next thing you look at, do I find a specific sequence a thousand times with the same sequence information? Or what is my percentage of, let's say, for example, I find the 200 base pair piece. Do I find this sequence of the 200 base pair piece a hundred times, a thousand times, or do I find it only 10 times? So if there is variation in the sequence, then you already know there's been mistakes. If you use one single organism. If you have several samples, um, but you don't have replicates, um, may have maybe problem. difference individuals, and oh. one, one sample per individual, yes. but you don't have replicates from each one, just one for every individual. And that depends on your individuals. Are there homozygous? Are there uh, uh, even a clone? Uh, or are they, uh, the mid let's assume we talk about this being uh, a homozygous plant. Mm -hmm. Then, or better yet, even if it's a clone. And you have 10, exact, 10, 10 individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, there is two things you have to consider. First of all, when you use different individuals, there's always a chance you might pick up a mutation. Secondly, uh, when you sequence this, you compare this, normally you would expect that every sequence is the same because it's a clone or um, a, a homozygous plant. Let alone there's a few mutations, but this should be a small fraction. If you all of a sudden find out there is a larger percentage of variation in it, either Genetically, your client was not homozygous, or better yet, it was mistakes in sequencing. So what you want to do for quality, you want to look at your, you get a whole set of sequences from the same stretch. You look at them, are they all the same? And the ones which are obviously different, that can, that could be a mutant, that could be a sequencing error, but if the bulk of the sequences, the higher percentages, uh, the same, that's what you want to use, that's a quality control. Then you actually eliminate the other ones. But you always have to, you know, you realize you always have to keep in mind where do you get the material from, what I do with it, and then you just look at it. But that's what the, the bioinformatics guy do. They just, what they call, we clean the sequence. Yes, but I am thinking about the money because the is not easy to not always, but sometimes it's difficult to to, to have a lot of, of sample of the, I don't know, I'm thinking about what I am seeing. Okay, <laughs> now, uh, this, is, this is not the issue. I mean, if you go, let's say you have five different individuals, mm -hmm. you take the DNA from those five individuals, you want to look at the variation between those individuals, you just attach barcodes to the pooled DNA of each individual, throw it into one well of your sequencer, and if you have five, you can put another 10 of them in there. Five times five, or 10 times five, this is one sequencing well. 
for that. And you know, it costs you exactly the same amount of money if you do one or 384. It's one run. This is the money. So you have actually quite a bit of flexibility. And if you just do one or two, it's financially no good. I mean, <laughs> you just don't get much for your money. More questions? Go to the end. No, then. I don't know what the day is. Let's, go. Let's do a short break. We have two more things to do. Or oh, you want to have a short break, and then we have look at GWAS and uh, genome assembly uh, of uh, mapping, association mapping, then we still have to do the CRISPR. It's 10 o'clock. What do we do? Okay, great. <laughs> I just let's make it a short one. <laughs> no, uh, we go away from the, you cut this out. <laughs> I don't want to see myself on the internet jumping around like a clown. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, uh, we go away now from assembling genomes and go to some more uh, useful things, so to put it, just using sequence information to actually map plants. And then what I want to do now is go genotyping by sequencing and association mapping. Now, we have to, again, a couple of definitions on genotyping by sequencing and genome-wide association mapping. And then we look at SNP detection by next generation sequencing. We look at some workflow at GBS, and I bring you an example of where they actually use this technology to look at populations of switchgrass. Switchgrass is a, uh, considered in North America as one of those renewable resources. It grows real rapidly. You get a lot of biomass. You can use it in biofermenters and uh, something like this. So, you remember segregation is equal amount independent segregation. Oh, Gregor Mendel comes here. So you have. Uh, individual linkage groups will be segregated independently from each other. Everybody agrees with that. Yeah. So the proportion is half and half. So go either this way or that way. Linkage, on the other hand, is if these, if markers segregate together, so the segregation frequency is less than 0.5. So if something is on the same chromosome physically, it will probably go <coughs> into the offspring together on this chromosome. Now we also learned that loci on a linkage group, when they are in quotation mark far apart, far here means they're not physically far, but they're just recombinationally far apart. That means there is the possibility of a ring combination. Crossing over is what you see in the microscope. And finally, we use recombination frequency to construct linkage maps. Everybody probably knows that by now, should know, because the next thing we look at linkage and segregation in populations. Up to now, we always assume life is simple. You have two parents, you cross them, you get offspring, F1, F2, and everybody's happy. Now, now we look at populations. Populations are plants which are happily reproducing in different areas, and the question is, how, to which extent are they interrelated? So these are populations, and we look at linkage equilibrium. This means linkage equilibrium if the markers, loci, or traits of a linkage group in a population, not in a single cross, in the population, are distributed evenly one to one, then linkage is normal and everything is fine. So they behave as they should behave. 
What? Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Exactly. Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. But you have, and this is what we want, linkage disequilibrium. This means certain traits, markers, SNPs are not distributed in an equal ratio in the population, less than 0.5. As linkage is equilibrium, in other words, if you look at a population, let's say white fl uh, red flower and resistance against a virus in the population always seem to be linked. And you have linkage disequilibrium. Normally, in a large population, with many of, if they would not be linked, although they're on the same linkage group, probability-wise in a large population, still there should be recombinations between the two markers. And in a population, remember, we talk about populations, not about individual crosses. And in the population, they should be spread evenly among the population. If they're not, then we have linkage disequilibrium. So, this can be used actually for genome-wide association analysis. In incidental, this was originally developed for human genetics. So you look, ask the question, are there, is there a relationship between a, specific, between a specific allele and a trait within a population? So always one trait, two traits are linked. That would be associated. And if you look at an association study, you identify genetic observations, uh, association which can be observed in a population, and you follow this by the absence or presence of SNPs. So if you associate SNPs with a marker, a trait, and you look at a large population, you ask the question, uh, this is that particular SNP, or this group of SNPs, actually we always talk about many SNPs, associate with a specific trait. <coughs> and if they are, what, what would be the advantage if you have uh, one specific trait associated with a set of SNPs in the population. You can mark the characteristic. Exactly, and what you can use it for? For selection. Exactly, you can do like selection and breeding. And of course, I told you before, to be able to do this, you need a pattern of linkage to the equilibrium if they would spread evenly in the population between both linkage groups then you would not, that means recombination happens, breaks linkage disequilibrium, so it's useless. And what you also need, a large number of SNPs. So up to now we talked about individual molecular markers, now we talk about 50 to 100 SNPs, which, is, which are associated with a specific trait, and then we can use that for selection. And this became only possible after uh, we have this um, new next generation sequencing technology available. Because before that was just not doable, not even, you couldn't even pay for it, I mean, let alone to do it. Now we have to look at another entity in this respect. Before this, here again, we looked at a cross with two parents and you know you have two haploid uh, genomes which are represented in the gametes and they have a certain DNA sequence. Now in a population they have haplotypes. So in a population you might have a specific trait but if you look at different haploid chromosomes in a population there might be more mutants involved. So that's what they refer to as haplotypes. So in this example, for instance, they're all individual chromosomes, part of a larger chromosome with a linkage to a specific trait. Nonetheless, you find individual differences in certain positions in the population. And some of the differences actually give you SNPs, 
And if those SNPs rep represent different mutations, you got to know it. So a different uh, haploid is a single chromosome set. Haplotypes refer to differences in individual DNA molecules in a population. And when you do this, you can use a software tassel for genotyping by sequences. See? And when you associate certain SNPs, many SNPs with a certain trait, and you plot it all against the frequency and along the genome, these are each color represents a different chromosome. The out of seven find that in a specific chromosome like here, here or here, there is a accumulation of SNPs associated with the trait. This is easily to be seen what they call a Manhattan plot. I guess it's obvious why it's called a Manhattan plot. So you identify SNPs associated with a certain trait in the population. I <clears throat> have a question. Um, I heard someone saying that U.S. aren't like not always tell you what you're looking at, so you have to confirm it with mutants. Well, this is always useful, but you can't do it all the time. But if you have uh, a large number of SNPs, and you look at populations, and they're closely linked, you're pretty much on the safe side, even if you don't have a chance to uh, for knockout. But you're right, I mean, the best way is if, you, like it's like with any molecular marker, we talked about this before, that the molecular marker is located inside of the coding sequences or something of the gene in question, that is the best. Oftentimes they're not associated with the gene in question, they're somewhere else, but they're closely correlated. There could be a recombination between the two. But here, we have one big advantage. We don't look at one molecular marker. We look at maybe 50 molecular markers. And the probability, and, and we don't know exactly where they're located, but we know in that particular haplotype, it's associated with this particular uh, trait. So even if you lose one or two markers out of your 50, and 48 still go along with it, you're OK. And when you talk about um, that you identify uh, some or uh, one or two or three SNPs related with one uh, specific trait, you are talking about a QTL. Well, this could be QTLs, most likely will, but we talk about many more SNPs than three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's the two, the two different things. Mm -hmm. One is the number of SNPs. There are many. But uh, it could be QTL, but it could also be a qualitative marker. It doesn't make any difference. It does. You just uh, you know to, to analyze the uh, the gene expression. That's a different story. Like QTLs, you have uh, like one percent expression to let's say ninety percent expression. But it's that that is one set of uh, calculations. But here you just have your uh, SNPs. They're associated. I don't know what would happen. I'm just trying to think if uh, you have 50% of the SNPs uh, would be only 50% expression. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be quite sure how to handle that. I have another one. I don't know if you're going to explain it later. It's about how to read that graph because you point, you put. Um, there are three um, peaks yes. that you have an arrow on them, but I see other peaks. How do I know like the quality of the association? This is goes along your question. You have to set lot you have to set lot scores. Mm -hmm. And this is a statistical methodology in QGLs. You say, okay, my lot score is this high. Anything higher than that is meaningful. Let's see down here. If you plot it 
in a different way. You see lots of peaks down here, but they're useless. This is here grain size. Now this is obviously a quantitative trade marker, so you have to have some way to define a cutoff. And once whatever thing sticks out on the top, it's useful, and the other's not. That's exactly what you what you were alluding to. But I'm not going to go into this. Well, this is what the breeders do. They, they have lots, lot. It's called LOD scores. That defines uh, even not with this technology, with any other marker. You need lot scores to define in a breeding program. What is above this? This is a meaningful information of segregation. Anything below that is what we call a background noise. It's a background noise, but it's not useful. Does it answer your question? Yes. Okay, now to actually do detection for SNPs, you need, uh, typically you don't sequence the entire genome, but you use reduced representation, like rat sequencing. Of course, you do this by highly multiplex sequencing, because you need lots of information in the population. And then, of course, there has to be a bioinformatic pipeline First of all, to detect SNPs, which are associated. And then once you have the bioinformatic pipeline, you keep sequencing all different individuals from a population and do the genotyping. And then finally, you can do your diversity analysis. Now this is a schematic representation how you do that. You prepare the samples, cut it, produce libraries, sequence. After the sequencing, you go through SNP calling. Once you have the SNP calling, you have identified SNPs associated. Then you do a diversity analysis, and hopefully there should be dots in one quadrant and a few dots here or whatsoever. And then you get different populations. And remember, we don't talk about individual crosses, we talk about populations. Now the workflow for this is quite simple to get uh, reduced representation. Typically you use a restriction headline 8K1. You cut your genome, then you produce sticky ends on it, sequence it, put your barcodes in. And the idea is remember AFLP. Your sequences were anchored around two restriction sites. So you just look left and right of a restriction site. Same principle here. You just get pieces of DNA which are centered or located around those restriction sites. Because you know you cut there, the rest, where there is no restriction site, you don't see. This is the big advantage because you know think about the large quantity of data you have when you sequence an entire genome. So it's too much, so you just make reduced representation. And once you have this, the usual thing, barcoding, you amplify it by PCR in a multi-well plate, go through the sequencer, and what you get then is uh, sequences which contain a barcode. Then, oops. Then we have the restriction site associated with it. Then we have unknown DNA sequences. So you cut your entire genome with A1, attach to each individual piece a barcode, and then you just uh, sequence it. And then you look, this is already gained in silico. You just sort all the ones with the brown barcode in one well in silico, the greens and the green and so on. So you have all similar sequences or rather similar barcodes in the same well. So this would be individual population, one from the population, individual, individual, individual. So you sort them like this and here just to give you some idea how to put the barcodes on, you take sample one, sample two, sample three, amplify it, take the amplicons, and they shouldn't be all that big, and then you repair the overhang, ligate two, you're still on the same sample, 
ligate to all these pieces of DNA your indexer. And once this is all done, sample A now at this point can be uniquely identified by the barcode. And then you just mix it all in one pool and you can sequence this. Now the barcode looks like, adapter looks like this. You have your DNA you want to insert. You don't know the sequence of that. You have always a common adapter. So each sequence for the sequencing machine has one adapter, one end. And on the other end, you set a barcode adapter. And this would be your barcode sequence in this case. So both adapters are amenable to the sequencing technology, but here in this one, a small stretch in it. And then you just uh, attach this by PCR priming, and then you get a sequence which contains your insert, insert sequence plus the barcoded adapter in one end. Yeah? I am a little confused when you talk about barcode. Uh, three different uh, ways, common adapter, barcode sequence, and barcode adapter. I, I, I have a clear uh, definition about the index. Sometimes that's the same. It's the same. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. the index is uh -huh. by using the barcode. Okay, but when you talk about home adapter, yes, because uh, I think when you talk about index or barcode, you have to choose the difference one for each sample. Yes, but you're perfectly control. correct. But uh -huh. there is always, remember the bridge amplification uh -huh. on, the, on the Illumina? Yeah. One side is this, everything is the same. Okay, okay. Yeah. The other side is almost the same, but every sample has a difference here. So every pooled sample, go back to this picture, this sample number one, let's say it gets the barcode ATGC. The rest of the adapters are the same. Sample two gets a different barcode. Like you change, keep changing this. And this way, each pool is identifiable by a unique sequence. And this way, you can throw it all in one pot, sequence it, and then let the computer sort it out. Clear? Is that, did, did I explain it to you properly? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, good. Now this is more of, less of a genotyping by sequencing protocol. It looks complex. You have sample preparation with amplification. You put libraries together with barcode, then you sequence. Then you have to find out when you haven't done it before, which are SNPs associated with my trait. And finally, once you're done with that, you do the diversity analysis in the population. And what is a very important tool is this TASL GPS, uh, GPS pipeline. And TASL stands for Trait Analysis by Association, Evolution, and Linkage. It's quite a word, so they translate it as TASL, which is nice because the TASL in corn. So uh, the interesting thing is you don't have to use these 8K1. You could use different restriction endonucleases. You're not restricted to that. It works nearly with all of them, restriction enzymes and barcoding approaches. And this example I showed you with four bases on a barcode. Is it very good, from your opinion? Four bases in the barcode. You have many different samples you want to barcode. Is a four base barcode good? No. 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 Probability wise, I mean, around three times and you've got it the same. No. Should be much longer, but this is just for the example. Mm -hmm. But you, no matter what you do, what barcodes you use, TASL would work. And it handles very large number of data and samples, which is quite useful. Now the pipeline to do this. And we start here, you remember, FASTQ files. We've got this coming out of the sequencer. Then the barcodes are removed 
in the minute you have sorted them according to barcode, then you have so-called tags, and tags are pools of sequences with the same barcode. And then you pile them together, and then you finally get sort of short tags, which are representing a physical map of those tags off the same barcode. And then eventually you boil this down to a single set of tags with barcodes on it, uh, sorry, with different SNPs on it, which you can use then identify differences in your population. And that is finally the pipeline. You start with fast Q files, you produce a set of master tags, then start first uh, tags on the physical map of the short stretch. Then you keep recycling and keep calling SNPs, and eventually you get a good set of SNPs associated with your trait. And once you have this all set up, you know which SNPs to look for. Then you have the production pipeline. Then you come with a large population. And then you just go through this process, which is set up here, and identify genotypes in a population. So you can handle with uh, genotyping by sequencing and castle large number of markers which are potentially produced. Let's say 50, 100, doesn't matter. Uh, it's very cheap. You just cut with a restriction enzyme your entire sample. To set it up, remember, we had different costs cut with a restriction enzyme, add your barcode to each pool sample, and then uh, put it on the adapters, sequence it. It's pretty cheap. And uh, you can combine very nicely SNP discovery and SNP calling. So how to identify SNPs and how to call uh, SNPs which are related to a specific trait. What is not good? when you have very low coverage in sequencing, you have lots of mistake. And you have lots of data missing, but why, what is the problem of low coverage here? Why does it cause difficulties? Why, need you, why do you need high coverage in your sequence that this technology works? about the haplotypes. There are differences in individual haplotypes. And if you don't have good coverage, you have mistakes. And you look for individual SNPs. You have poor coverage. It doesn't really work. So you need high coverage. But when you if we go all the way back to sequencing technologies, what would you use? You make a comparison. We looked at reduced representation sequencing, which is important because you get deep, high coverage. And you definitely wouldn't be want to using single molecule real time sequencing. First of all, it's not only expensive, but you know, your sequencing depth is not sufficient. So, too many mistakes. Now let's look at an example. And actually, you should remember those names like Jeff Glaubitz and then Ed Buckler. These are the guys who actually did develop all this in uh, Ithaca, New York, Cornell University. So they used switchgrass and they sequenced switchgrass. And the, first of all, they sequenced switchgrass per se, and then they switchgrass, a large population of switchgrass in the northeastern United States looked at differences in the populations. So you have different chromosomes, you sequence the chromosomes, and remember here these are the restriction size of APK1, reduced representation sequencing. Then they sequence the stretches and then they looked in silico. First of all they looked for sequences which appear 
a number of times as the same sequence. Remember k mers So you throw everything out which is there a lot of times, but only once. So these are errors. Next thing they did, probably for easy handling in the computer, they cut every sequence to 64 bases. So they threw a lot of information away, but it was obviously it's sufficient to work with it. And next thing they did, they looked at tags which were the same. You look at different tags, and so well, when many tags, we're talking about a population. When the tags are the same in one population, this is one marker set. Second, third, this obviously had mistakes in it. So they looked for tags which were statistically sound as far as sequence is concerned. Then they looked at pairwise alignment of these tags of different populations. So they looked for tags which are the same sound statistically and took this as one and compared this to another set of tags from a different population and asked the question, is there a difference? And with this difference, you can detect single base pair mismatches. And that's what you want to do. And with this technology, they found 1.6 million punitive SNPs. To reiterate, you sequence different populations. Look for, for all the sequences which are the same. Eliminate errors. Make out of this sort of a consolidated sequence. Then you compare consolidated sequence from area one with a consolidated sequence of area two of the same tag, because most of the sequence there will be the same. So you expect to see SNPs. And that's what comes out of it. In doing so, in this procedure, they found out one, two, three, four, five, six different populations of switchgrass in different areas they marked by color, the, some of them actually in the same areas, some of them like the blue one here, they call it the lowland northeast. They were more or less separated from the rest of the population because they carried through linkage disequilibrium certain SNPs only in that particular population. So they didn't do any cross here. They just looked at populations and then defined a biodiversity in a certain region. But this technology, per se, you can always use also for mark analysis. But I find this quite a nice example to use population genetics to identify biodiversity. Questions up to here? Previous. Back. In, in the fourth step, the power wasting alignment, yeah. those are of different population. Exactly. So each tag, like it's tag one, tag two, tag three, but tag one is from, let's, from one population and has a specific sequence, but also tag one from population two, population three, because most of the sequence of tag one are the same. So they compare essentially a small stretch of sequence from population one with the same stretch of sequence from population two and ask the question, are there differences? Clear? Okay. Yes, so segregation, linkage, we talked about this, important for population genetics is linkage is equilibrium. Association of traits, markers with population in a population and association with molecular markers, SNPs in our case. And you would talk about genotype and more importantly when you talk about populations you talk about haplotypes. In fact uh, I showed you this uh, one picture of this iron torrent sequencer which runs you a whole sequence in, an, in three hours. The idea is of course the doctors office in the 
They just come, you come there, give you a blood sample, you run the sequence, looks at your haplotype because we're a population, and then they ask the question with this particular haplotype, what medication would be very useful for you as opposed to another individual? So in a population, we all have different haplotypes, although we have pretty much all the same genes, but they're haplotype differences. And all of this actually was in, developed in human genetics. So then we looked at GBS sequencing and had a brief look at the software TASL to, for SNP detection and SNP processing in populations. And I showed you the example of the switchgrass. Good. Also, when you talk about open pollinated species, you talk about appetites. Yep. Just look at one stretch of DNA. But we look in a population. And uh, I don't care if it's open populated, if it's open pollinated or there's still haplotypes. So this technique is also useful for conservation uh, studies. I mean, uh, if there's a population with low exchange of genes, yes. it can be detected. No, for instance, if I wanted to know, like, uh, I guess Costa Rica is a very good country for doing this. I mean, there's a lot of population of certain plants, and you have this enormous variation in uh, topography. So it would go like this. This particular one here, I find the same species here. The question is, are they related? Mm -hmm. To which extent? Um, obviously, they're related, the same species. But are there, has there been exchange between the two? Has there been no exchange? It would be interesting to look at bananas, but I'm sure this is a, obviously a clone. You find point mutations on more. There's no population, so. But I know there, are, we once looked at this in, in some quassia. It's a medicinal plant which grows in the Caribbean. And we wanted to know whether uh, there are differences. You know, you get all these natural accessions, and when you want to do something with it, you want to have accessions which produce the active component in a reasonable amount of uh, quality and quantity. So the thing to do is associate production of a secondary metabolite with a certain genotype. The plants look all the same. So you just do an analysis like this and pick those which are the highest, and then you have to try to clone them. I have any uh, question. Yeah. To do to analyze those haplotypes, how many individuals you you need to take to oh, the population, the proportion of individual of the population? Um, we take individuals. Yeah, but if the population is, is I I don't know, one thousand individuals, how many in, individuals you have to take to make those haplotypes? If you were to look at, uh, like, uh, if you take 10 individuals, you might run into 10 haplotypes. But you might only run into one haplotype. Uh, I, I can't really give you the answer, because it depends how many mutations that you accumulate. But the, the big difference being, if you take population from location A, and you compare this to a population of location B, I would expect more differences in the haplotypes than within one location. Particularly if it's a selfing population, now you don't want to see many differences in haplotypes. If it's an outcrossing population, you see more differences in a group in one location, but you would expect to see a bigger difference between this one and the other one separated by a big mountain. But how many individuals you have to take I can't really give you offhand an idea. I probably would take sequence 100 there, a sequence 100 here, and have a look. It could well be. I mean, if the frequency of mutation in those haplotypes is very small, obviously you need higher numbers. But you always look at each individual. So if you have, pick a sample of 10, 10 times sequence. If you get 100, 100 times sequencing else, you don't get the tags which you can compare. And then once you have consolidated tags, you can compare to the other population. If you have something which is brand new, nobody knows anything about it. But you know, 
those things are not that expensive anymore. You have to isolate DNA with a kit, do the sequencing, and you can throw a lot of things in the sequencer. Even if you take only a 96 well plate, 96 times 50 per, per well, well, this is a lot of plants. And the sequencing costs stay the same for one plate. So you might as well just fill it up as much as you can. Okay, more questions. Okay, then we completely switch subject. Now, up till this point, we look at genomes as they are. Now we look at possibilities to change genomes. So we do uh, sequence editing. We have to pick up a different set of transparencies. If the computer cooperates, yes it does. Okay, now we're going to talk about CRISPR-Cas. Now, there are two authors on this. And the first one is my daughter. She, she did this as a high school project, and she did a great job. And so I said, I will fix it up a bit and then keep her on there. She's going to study biology next year, so it's <laughs> great. So Patricia put this all together, and I just spruced it up a bit. So uh, I introduced her to CRISPR. I also will explain what it means. Then we look at what it actually does in real life, because uh, it's not an invention of a biotechnologist, but it's something in biology. And then we we'll, oops. Then we we'll look at CRISPR Cas9 for genome editing, but I only will talk about the possibilities in higher plants. I'm not talking about anything in animals. They are in a fortunate situation. They have homologous recombination. We don't have in plants. But anyways, then we'll look at an example of genome editing in tomato. And we'll hear more about this this afternoon on rice. Anyways, what is CRISPR-Cas? This is sort of an overview of the function of it. It's actually acquired immunity in bacteria. So if a bacterial cell gets infected by a bacterial phage or a bacterial virus, it injects its DNA into the organism with the idea to integrate this or at least replicate the DNA inside of the bacterium and express all the genes eventually to produce lots of more viruses which are packaged and then are released. In most cases, upon release, the bacterial cell dies. So when this foreign DNA comes from the virus into a cell and somehow the virus, bacterial virus, get, doesn't get on a quick start, the bacterial cell has a chance to survive. And in this process, bacterial DNA will be in the cell and this is called acquisition. This DNA will be incorporated in a set of genes, the Cas group of genes, the CRISPR genes and it will be also transcribed and stored in the bacterial cell. Once this is done and there is secondary infection comes with the same virus, the bacterial cell is now capable of using the stored sequence from the original infection and use this to direct by a guided RNA to target the viral DNA cut it. This way protecting the bacterial cell. Now a few explanations to some of the words like CRISPR means clustered, regulatory, interspersed, short, palindromic repeats. That's what CRISPR means. There are nucleotide repeats and there are spaces and these spaces actually are the viral DNA pieces which were picked up while the bacterium survived an infection. 
Now Cas9 stands for an endonuclease, which cuts double-stranded DNA only if PEM, PEM motive is present. That stands for produce, baser, adjacent motive. We'll get to these details, but it's important. And the Cas9 binds to CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA. Both are directing the enzyme Cas to the infective DNA from the virus. But the CRISPR RNA is the one transcribed spacer into RNA from the previous infection. And then you have the transacting CRISPR RNA, which is located genetic uh, on the genome in a different position, but it's necessary for the soul procedure to act. Now in a bacterial cell, this looks like this. You have your trace RNA, then you have a set of enzymes, all Cas, but we'll only talk about Cas9 later on because that's used in editing genomes of higher plants, but you have to be aware of there are many different Cas type genes in bacterial cells. And then there is a repeat space array. Repeats are always the same, but the spacers are the, the colorful ones here. Are these the bits and pieces of DNA which have been picked up by previous infections? So you realize here there is a whole array of spacers. What does it tell you? It has been attacked by different viruses. Exactly. What does it mean for the bacteria? It can resist viruses and has picked up. Exactly. The vi actually, this poor guy here has been by infected by one, two, three, four, five uh, viruses and he survived three, five virus infections. But if those three virus, five viruses come along again, you're going to be dead. Typically, when you look at the gene more detail, there is a tracer RNA, which is necessary that it works. Those spacers gives your CRISPR RNA in the, when they're translated together with the tracer RNA will be able to guide Cas to cut the DNA of the virus. So the Cas9, again, it's not a simple thing. It's two nucleases which generate double-stranded breaks. The repeats are between 30, 28 and 37 base pair, and they are dyad symmetry. Dyad symmetry means they kind of hybridize to each other, so you get hairpin structures. So they just kind of look like this. That's important, I guess, for the Cas to anchor, which are the DNAs picked up from the infecting virus. They're also between 32 and 38 base pair sequences. And typically, a CRISPR locus, that's the whole thing, that's the CRISPR locus, the bacterium contains approximately 50 units, up to 50 units of repeat space arrays. So there's quite a sort of a library of uh, spaces there to fight various viruses. So how does it work in the bacterium? We still talk about prokaryotes. So, as I mentioned before, a new virus comes around, the bacterial cell has not been previously infected by the virus, and second obvious thing, the, viral, the bacterial cell has to survive, else the whole thing doesn't work. So no previous infection and uh, uh, the cell has to survive. But when this happens, this is sort of the foreign DNA, and on the foreign DNA, there are sequences. And next to the sequence, there should be N and two Gs. And that's the protospacer adjacent motive. And that's spread around in many sequences. This will be picked up as a spacer by the bacterial genome in the CRISPR locus. Next step is, once it's there, it's being processed and cut in individual pieces, and part of it is actually your pre-spacer RNA, which will bind 
together with the CRISPR RNA to your target DNA containing the target DNA plus the PEM motif. And this finally will be, this is stored in the bacterial cell and upon virus infection, this is going to happen. So this is essentially the guide RNA which will guide the Cas9 or the Cas enzyme towards the virus DNA to cut it. When this happened, you got your Cas9, in this case I used Cas9 again, your foreign viral DNA will be, the Cas9 will be guided by the CRISPR RNA the, uh, and the, uh, the tracer plus the PAM sequence, the next the PAM sequence, see this is homologous from the origin of the target, it'll cut. So the idea is, now we go to uh, eukaryotes, the idea is unlike standard mutagenesis, which is add something, get random mutagenesis, random SNPs or point mutations. Here in this case, you can direct actually the mutation towards a specific gene. For instance, if you have a binding site for a fungus on the surface of a plant cell, and you can actually direct your CRISPR system to make a knockout mutant of the binding sites, that would be quite useful. So people thought about this, and uh, the people who proposed this originally were uh, two groups who have been fighting quite a bit for that. <laughs> so this was Charpentier and Dudna, French and US, and independently another group in the US. Uh, they published first, they published afterwards, but they say they were earlier, so there's quite a fight on it. And that's, I guess, is the reason why there hasn't been a Nobel Prize on it. And there are patents on it, and God knows, and I don't care. But anyways, uh, as science is sometimes competitive, and people just go down and get the knives out. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, they propose it, and let's now look what, what was done, and actually the system being used is from those two women, scientists. So they use protein, the Cas9 is from Streptococcus pyogenes, and they use actually, that's the smart thing. Remember, there's the tracer RNA and the CRISPR RNA. They produce a uh, chimeric RNA combining both. And then you can actually do specific cleavages. And as I said before, the modification was possible to actually direct easy cutting of specific genes in cells. And it's in, relatively inexpensive. And you know, always remember, what you do normally when you do this, you make a knockout mutation. So if you cut in the middle of a gene, because you can do that, because you have the sequence of the gene, which is homologous to the gene, so you just cut in the middle of your target gene, and when you cut something in the middle of it, I mean, it's dead. So no, it's a, a typical knockout mutation. And, uh, of course, to be able to do this, you have to know the target sequence in the first place, which today we're in a good situation that oftentimes we know this. Now, what I'd like to clear at this point immediately, because this can be done in uh, mammalian cells quite easily, in those cells we know how homologous recombination works. So if you bring in you cut and at the same time replace. You can actually take one defective gene out or take a gene out and put another one in. This is very nice. Unfortunately, we can't do this in plant cells because homologous recombination is a tricky business, it's extremely rare. A colleague of mine who works in Karlsruhe, he's been working on this very successfully, but so it's not a methodology which helps you a lot. So, when you use Cas9 endonuclease, you need to determine your target sequence. Then you generate a plasmid with this 
single guide RNA. The single guide RNA is actually a chimeric RNA of the transcribed spacer RNA plus the tracer RNA. That's one piece. And this is still in your Eppendorf tube. Next thing you do, you need agrobacterium tumefacients or a different technology for genetic transformation to enter this particular material into a higher plant cell. Remember, when you do this, you get a GMO. And in Germany, this is a European Union, it's all illegal, which is really stupid. But anyways, that's my personal comment. <laughs> <laughs> but with this, you get double strand breaks in the target sequence. And the thing is, you look at the T0 events, that is your event which comes out of the primary transformation. And this should be a knockout of that particular gene. You can find this with markers and all sorts of things. And then you isolate T0 events with, and that is the beautiful part, which have a homologous replacement of the target genes. And we'll get to this in the example. So you actually don't have homologous recombination, but you have homologous replacement. So you put another gene into the position of the target gene. And normally this is rare, but more often you get double strand breaks by those cutting, by those two enzymes, then you get non-homologous end joining in the cell. So you just cut something and then join the ends, and of course, there's mistakes in it, and it's a knockout. The good thing is, if you find those, you can go in the next generation, and hopefully find, when you sell them, those which have recombination come to homologous, replacements without the whole package which came in with two agrobacterium as in transformation. So then that you have a uh, genotype which contains a new type of gene in the old position without any uh, DNA from the transformation system. So as far as I'm concerned, that's not transgenic, <laughs> but as far as the European Supreme Court is supported by all these jerks. I think it's transgender. <laughs> okay, well, cut the jerk part. <laughs> but it, so, just to compare those two, this is a natural CRISPR pathway in prokaryotes. You have your two RNAs, the tracer and the guide RNA, and then you have the activation with those RNAs to cut, make a double-stranded cut in your target DNA of the virus. This is the engineered system. You have a big plasmid, with the guide RNA, the target sequence, and your uh, tracer RNA in one piece. Then you have a Cas9 also coded on the plasmid. You bring this in a plant cell and your chimeric guide RNA together with Cas9 directs Cas9 to the target sequence, and you get a cut and essentially a knockout. I have a question. How long does the process take for each pathway? Uh, okay, it's very different. About this, I'm not quite clear. What is your question? How long does what the process? The process about to generate all the the. Well, how much time does it need to work to get to the Maybe, point? Maybe, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I'll give you one example. You, you just, uh, to generate this here, uh -huh. you buy it. And then you have, oh, well, that's important that you get, well, get it from a colleague. Uh -huh. Then you put your target sequence in there. So that's more like the biology. It's cloning, bacteria, I would say probably less than a week. I mean, you want to... Yeah make sure you sequence it afterwards to make sure whatever is in there is what you want it to be in there. Then you put this into agrobacterium tumor facients. You can do that by electroporation, probably the fastest. Isolate this, takes another 24 hours. There are markers, like antibiotic markers in there. So you pick the agrobacteria, 
which carry this particular designed plasmid with your target sequence. That's the easy part. Then you have to make a genetic transformation. This is species dependent. Depends on the, the tissue you can transform. I can tell you how this works in hop. You take internodes, dip it into uh, agrobacterium solution, let it incubate for 48 hours, wash away the, the agrobacteria, and then you just keep selecting, and overall the process takes nine months. So that's when the biology comes in, not the test tube, it takes longer. And, but this depends very much on the species. The other species around, like people used to work with tobacco, it's just like that. It goes real quick, but you know, tobacco is not a real useful plant. Actually, it's poisonous. <laughs> so <laughs> there are more useful plants around, so uh, it takes longer. But you talk, to get knockouts, you might be talking about a year, depending on the species. But I, I'm interested to hear what Randall is going to tell us this afternoon. I work with um, agrobacterium. I did it in different projects. And the CRISPR part is actually very quick. But what's hard is that uh, sometimes the mutation is not very stable. So it depends on exactly what you're working on and the plant that you're working on. Because I transform um, Philanthus with agrobacterium. And it actually grew very quick. So it was like a two months, three months. And I already had the plants, transformed plants. But they were like this size. So it depends on what you're going to use them. And then uh, you use, it usually comes with like, um, well, first you have to remove the bacteria because you Yeah, can. that's a tricky part. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they don't survive when you remove the bacteria. But you can already, um, with markers and DNA, blah, blah, blah um, you can already see if the mutation is there. But it depends of what you're going to use the plant for <laughs> and how you need it. Yeah, really, I like the, the, exactly what you say. I mean, the tissue culture part, which comes after the transformation, that is the drawn out one, that's the complicated one. Unfortunately, uh, you know, antibiotics, which we use for selecting, were designed for mammals. Many antibiotics are pretty poisonous for plants. So it's a very limited amount, like uh, uh, one or two, which you can use with. Uh, with agrobacterium, and unfortunately, it doesn't kill it, it just stops it from dividing. Yeah. So, you eventually find it again. So, that is exactly as you say, it's species dependent and it's tissue culture, it takes a while. So, what happens when it happens in the cell? You have your uh, single chimeric RNA which directs this is one part, see, so there is a specific CRISPR RNA, which is the one originally, remember, in bacteria, viruses, which was taken from the bacteria, the virus. In our case, it's taken from the target gene. And then you have a linker loop, and then there is your tracer RNA, and this is now placed together in the same system. And this way you can direct the Cas9 to your RNA, and close to the protospacer adjacent motifs, it cuts with one strand with the H and N and the one rubic C in the other strand. Double stranded cut. <coughs> That's a bit more in detail. You have your PAM sequence. There's an N that could be something there, but there has to be two C's or two, two G's. 20 nucleotides is a recognition sequence of the uh, spacer transcribed RNA. It's a big space of DNA transcribed into RNA. Then at this point, those two enzymes cut. This is uh, what you get out of the whole thing. Remember, the uh, trace RNA has a stem loop uh, or dyad structure. So you get physically something like this. It directs Cas9 with the uh, CRISPR RNA towards the DNA. You get here, the PAM sequence is on our show. You get here, you cut. You have two possibilities. 
provided it cuts at all, but let's assume it cuts. First and most common is non homologous end joining. So you have two pieces with blunt end cut, and then of course, you, unfortunately, it doesn't fix it, it just puts it together and makes mistakes. So mistakes in the middle of a gene is a mutation. And it's a knockout in the end because the gene doesn't function anymore. But sometimes it's nicer, but it's more rare. You provide a different piece of DNA, which instead of the sort of not very nice repair, gets replaced in this. And this is homology-directed repair. So you repair the DNA with a homologous piece of DNA. And then, of course, you have an editing function, provided it gets there in the frame with a reading frame. But then you have one gene, or one part of the gene replaced with another part of it. And I'd like to uh, show you this on an example which they used. This is targeted mutagenesis of tomato lines. And I mean, it's a nice example, not very practical, but it's nice to, to be able to do. So they looked at long shelf life of tomato. And this is the example where they used. Obviously, there is a tomato genotype around when this ALC, which stands for Alcobaca, so it's a Spanish tobacco line, uh, which has, when it's recessive homozygous in this tomato, did I say tobacco? I mean tomato. <laughs> <laughs> when it's recessive in these tomatoes, you can hang it up for 40 days and then it starts to shrivel. And I understand, I don't know who does it, that's a picture from uh, Spain where they keep hanging the tomatoes, I guess, in the kitchen like this. I don't know. Anyways, recessive ALC, homozygous, prolonged storage life. Over here is a uh, Heterozygous one, you see that starts to shrivel earlier, and if it's homozygous wild type, bingo, 20 days it's gone. So the question is, can I actually introduce this recessive marker by CRISPR-Cas in a wild type? So they produced the Cazette, CRISPR-Cas expression Cazette in Agrobacterium, introduced it into Agrobacterium to the patients. And I assume everybody knows how agrobacterial transformation works. Who doesn't know? Agrobacterium tumefaciens transformation. Who's not familiar with it? Yes. Everybody? Okay, good. Then I don't know what I'm talking about. So and then they looked at uh, the T0 plants, which are obviously transgenic. And then they looked uh, at the expression cassette and asked, what? the wild type, remember capital writing here, uh, by sequence, non-homologous, end joint repair, knockouts. And then they wanted to look at replacement and get the uh, recessive allele. And if it's homologous in there, the client should have, the tomato should have a long shelf life. So this is how the cassette looks like, which they introduced by our plasmid into agrobacterium. There is your Cas9, and this is the 35S promoter, which is usually used, that's a constitutively expressed promoter at a high rate. And they usually use that in <coughs> genetic transformation. Then you have here the right border sequence and the left border sequence, they're important in the original T I plasmid you need those border sequences to, for the transformation to work. And anything between those, those two sequences will actually be going to the target cell. And then they have another promoter here, U6. It's from Arabidopsis. And it's a constitutive promoter. So they have different promoters. One for the uh, CAS enzyme, one for the gRNA. And this way, the gRNA gets trans and you want to watch this here next to the PAM sequence. This was one plasmid they introduced, and then they introduced another plasmid. Same structure except the target sequence was modified. 
there was a T instead of the A. So it's a point mutation which they introduced. Let's go back here. That's one, and that's the modified target sequence. And they wanted, and they will look for uh, homology directed replacement. And that's the template for that. So they want, originally this is in, they want to get this in. And they did it, and it worked. And this is the genetics of it. So what you see now, I put in this uh, graph, or the, this table actually, how does the transgenic plant look like? How does the genotype look like with respect to wild type and wild type gene, the edited gene, and what phenotype to expect? So let's look here. You have a transgenic plant, you have wild type, wild type, then nothing happened. If you have gene editing, you have either wild type, recessive, alcobaca, what phenotype do you expect? Wild type, because it's recessive. You have another one, we actually have replaced everything, alcobaca, alcobaca recessive, it's the mutant, and then you got a few more you don't want, because it's, it's heterozygous for the Cas gene, because remember, you made a transformation with a cassette which contains Cas plus the coding sequence for the RNA. When you make it transgenic, this is going to be incorporated in the genome. So this is transgenic, heterozygous, so this would be as far as the gene is concerned, plus Plus, it's wild type phenotype. Second one, you have an edited gene. It's again heterozygous wild type, and you have one plus uh, the uh, recessive. Recessive is mute. However, this is still in there, so it's a trend the GMO. Same down here. You have two copies of the. Uh, plasmid in there. Same thing, wild type, wild type, and mutant, but GMO. So in the end, this is the one you want. The, you've got two of them. One is heterozygous, wild type. One is homozygous, mutant. And the rest of the genome is free of cus, so that means it's non-GMO. That's the beauty of the system. In previous Transformations, you always have the rest of the transformation in there. Here, no. And this is how they did some breeding on it. They self the one with a wild type parent. So this is your one allele, which came in from the transgenic, and, they, and this is from the wild type. And then they selfed it. Then you have various genotypes. Wild type, heterozygous, homozygous, you look at numbers. With respect to Cas, plus with respect to Al Kabaka. And the interesting thing is when you look at those numbers, one to two to one. Very nice, well, very nice segregation. I mean, the numbers are not perfect, but when you look at the overall thing, you get very nice segregation of those traits in the offspring. Of course, this would be the one you want to sell. And in the phenotype, when you look at 40 days of storage, well, the homozygous recessive one, it looks fairly good, and this kind of suffered. As I said, I mean, it's not a particular interesting example in terms of commercial use, but I found it a very interesting example to see what are the outcomes of CRISPR-Cas gene editing. Okay, up to here questions, or uh, summarize first and then you ask the questions. Nothing? Okay, let's summarize. I mean, we talked about prokaryotes and the origin of the CRISPR system in prokaryotes, and that's a protective, it's adaptive immunity against infection through viruses. 
And I, we talked about the function of the CRISPR locus, composed of uh, the important part, the spacers and the, uh, and the uh, repetitive arrays. And then the adaptation of this system for eukaryotes. Then we looked at how genome editing can be done either by knockouts, and this is the definitely much more frequent, frequent uh, event you see. And the rare one is uh, not by none, uh, by its homologous end joining gene replacement. And this is the nice thing when you when you flip one gene to the other. Remember, they were cautious about this. They actually put a only one point mutation in there. I mean, they could put totally different stretch of DNA in there, or could more. They could be more bases which were changed, but they deliberately. Uh, didn't do this because they want to make sure they had very good homology so the Cas gene would bind, or the, rather the CRISPR RNA would bind exactly what it's supposed to bind. So they were cautious. I guess one could titrate this, how many bases can I change before the thing doesn't work anymore. But giving what you said, what my experience is with transformation, you don't do 50 or something like this, you make me two or three because Putting the DNA in there is easy, but selecting the right plant, that's where the money, the, the labor is. So finally, in the, we looked at this example of the non-shriveling tomato with long shelf life, where they actually did a homologous uh, replacement of the gene with a point mutation, generating a mutant which was defective in this ALC gene, which is actually a regulatory element, and so they made it defective and this way prolonging the shelf life of this tomato. And the nice beauty of the experiment is the gene was known, the phenotype was known, tomato has been sequenced, and then they just demonstrated really when we do exactly this, this is what's going to happen. I guess. That's right. <laughs> so you think of yourself being a bacterium or a plant cell, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> okay, so I think this comes, brings it to the end this morning. And this afternoon, I hope we'll really learn some very interesting things from Randall. Questions? I have a question with the last tomato film. This that, one? Uh, so my CRISPR has tomato has a recessive gene. So if I want to keep that phenotype, do I have to keep cloning the tomato? Because if I if I uh, if I use it as a parent line, just self I could just lose the mutation. Self. You just self it, that's it. But I think you easily can sell tomatoes. In a, in a, in a strictly uncrossing species, they have to do some more different uh -huh. things. So like you could go through uh, cloning of, uh, like you could actually use uh, microspore culture or anything, get haploids, and then use culture seed to make them diploid. Then you have uh, also uh, homozygous recessive glials. In your case, but what would you do actually? Let me put you this this question to you. It's an outcrossing species. You have a homozygous recessive one. How would you, as a breeder, get out of this trap? What was the question? The qu she, she said, what do I do to preserve a homozygous recessive allele in when I want to, you know, go into a large propagation of it. What could you do, I mean, aside microspore cultures, but what could you do if you were regular breeding and it's not a selfing species, but it's an outcrossing one, what could one do? Market and then select the, the oh, much more simple. Think about Gregor Mendel. You cut the dominant, no. You cross it. 
no What's the blood type? And what would your beer F2 look like? The question is uh -huh. there's 25% homozygous recessive. Yes. And then remember we talked about this again. Well, if you were selfing it, you could actually increase this, but in this case we, we cannot self it, so we just have to, have to cross it. So 25% of your offspring will be always homozygous for that particular trait. Cross the AF2 with the homologous, uh, that one? No. Uh, crossing the heterozygous with the, with the homologous yeah, well, you, you have You have your F2, you have the segregation, 25% will be like that, and then 25% of your offspring will have be recessive for this particular locus. Yeah, you just always yeah. have to Do cross again and you find always 25% uh, and if, if it would be a self <laughs> if it would be a self pollinating species I mean each one you go one step further down and probably by, by F8 you have uh, F6 to 8 you have 95% homology but this breeding process, I mean, this is expensive. It's long, but it's expensive. We talk about one or two generations a year. So what I'd probably do if I was a breeder and try to get microspore cultures going, get uh, the uh, haploids to grow, diploidize them with colchicine, that is probably when you need large numbers, so it's better. Okay, more questions. If not, well, we'll be back here by two o'clock and welcome Randall. And we're looking forward to what he's going to tell us about CRISPR-Cas. So thank you. Thank you.